good morning, everyone, and welcome to this first discussion in a series of strands on sexual revolutions that will be taking place in this room today. My name is Sally Millard, and I am the founder of the Association of Ideas Parents Forum. And as you probably guessed, I'll be chairing the discussion today. I can't believe myself that it's a year since the Me Too, hashtag Me Too movement uh, kicked off. And this time last year, I was sitting on a panel uh, debate and we were first contemplating uh, what happened. And I think if you look at what has happened uh, since that really kicked off a year ago, then the discussion of consent and what is consent, how do we consent, how do we say no, how do we not consent, um, has really uh, been in a, constantly in and out of the news. And as a result of that, uh, consent classes, teaching people what consent means, um, has also been a sub big subject for discussion. In fact, in one of the meetings here yesterday, talking about rape law, um, ended up being a discussion about consent classes. Do we need consent classes? Um, so I think... Um, it's, this discussion is timely and it's important because I think we do need to think for ourselves what, what do we think um, about consent classes? Are they a good way forward or, or not for people? And I myself am very interested in the conversation because uh, as I've thought through the discussion over the last year, I've changed my mind a few times about what I actually think. Um, so I think it is a, a conversation that's quite open and we should all uh, make the most of uh, having this opportunity uh, to discuss it. So um, I have got a fantastic panel of speakers who are going to introduce their thoughts on the um, matter for um, a short time, five to seven minutes. And then um, after they've spoken, we'll have an opportunity to go out to you for questions uh, and come back. I think if you came yesterday, you probably know how these things tend to work. Uh, my first speaker is going to be uh, Susan Edwards. And Susan is a professor at law at the University of, of Buckingham. Um, she's been writing on the area of, of women and the law for a, a number of years. And I, um, had, I read her book when it was uh, published. I don't want to give our ages away, but it was, uh, it was quite a, a while ago. And it really is the seminal work on uh, gender and the law. And so I think we're very lucky to have uh, Susan here uh, with us today. Next, I've got uh, Alicia, Alicia Lobo. Alicia is the uh, community officer at the Univer University of Bath Students Union, where she has um, promoted the Never OK campaign and I'm sure she'll um, tell us a little bit about that. Then I've got Elizabeth Robertson, who's going to speak. Um, Elizabeth is a professor and chair of English language at the University of Glasgow, and author of Chaucery and Consent, Women, Religion, and Subjection in, the late, medi in late Medieval England. And I think that sounds like a fascinating read, and some of the insights from that, um, from that discussion I think are uh, interesting to give us some uh, context or contrast to the discussion uh, today. Then I've got uh, Joanna Williams, uh, definitely last but not, but not least, um, who is going, she's the head of education and culture at the Think Tank Policy Exchange and the author of um, a book which I do recommend, Women Versus Feminism, Do We Need an End to the Gender Wars? And she's also associate editor of the online magazine, Spiked. So uh, that's my great panel. And without further ado, um, Sue. Uh, th thank you very much. So I'm going to try and stick to time. What can I say in this short time about the whole issue of consent? Well, of course, consent classes, I think, in many ways, the whole phrase. I was asked to speak on Sky News, I think, 2016, on consent classes. It was very awkward because what I really wanted to talk about was the widening climate of sexual harassment against women. And I think the whole question of consent classes has trivialized it. I think the media's trivialized consent classes. 
when what we want, and we'll hear uh, later from other panel members, we want a much wider programme of actually challenging the kinds of sexual representation which go from the way in which women who are victims of rape are represented, uh, the way in which the debate around just non-disclosure recently um, the way Alison Saunders was criticised and the way in which uh, the non-disclosure on rape seemed to capture everybody's mind that if we'd had the digital evidence it would have changed everything. The question about consent and consent to sex in particular is a question about what happens in the here and now, not what happened uh, digitally online several minutes or hours or days before or anywhere else. So consent is absolutely consent of the moment. And it does worry me that, in fact, the whole question of consent classes has transferred the responsibility of uh, who should take ownership of this much wider debate, which is about rape, sexual harassment, what bystanders should uh, be doing, the kind of coercion that goes on, not only in industry or in places of work, but also within universities and elsewhere, coercing women, LBGTQ, into having sexual encounters. And it disturbs me that it's been privatised when I think the state, whether it's the media, the entertainment industry, whether it's drama, whether it's film, uh, they need to take a responsibility. And of course, Love Island, uh, we could talk about that, but I think that's a worrying trend, that that's becoming the watch to, I mean, so many thousands, or is it millions, are actually watching this program which trades on uh, sexual relationships that we would not be encouraging and we would not think were necessarily healthy. Uh, within universities, the concern is to provide a safe environment and to suggest that we're being patronising or nannying. I think we want to do far more than have a few consent classes. What is consent? All right, so from a legal point of view, let's just get down to the question of penetrative sex, because there's all other forms of sex which are unwanted, which could be groping, kissing. Uh, but penetrative sex within the Sexual Offences Act, as we know, is about sex which is given fully, freely, where the person has capacity. And some of us might remember the case that sparked a lot of this off, which was an American case of somebody called Brock Turner in 2016, who was charged with rape because he had actually raped somebody who was unconscious. Yes, of course, I know, and conscious through drink, of course, I know there is a question, and the law has looked at that question about, well, you know, if you have a drink, does it mean that you can't consent? And, of course, the, the lines are very difficult there and blurred. Uh, but, of course, it is about, as I say, as far as the law is concerned, somebody who's got full capacity to, uh, to, to consent. And I think the other questions that we need to look at is the changing nature of consent. So, in fact, the law has taken on, in 2003, the, the notion that that other individual has to give their full consent and it has to be freely given, not with coercion uh, and, and not uh, because they are, are intoxicated. Um, uh, in 19... 80s, in the 1980s, there was a case called Olive Bozier, a very interesting case where I actually applaud the judge in that case because he was a 16-year-old girl, and this did change the whole barometer on the nature and understanding of consent, a 16-year-old girl who had actually got into a car with two men. She didn't really want to. She was somewhere where she couldn't get home. She got into a car with two men. She was taken back to their flat, and she was raped. And the whole question was, well, um, you know, she didn't struggle. She didn't cry out. Uh, she didn't, which is supposed to be an indicator of the fact that you are, resistance was always something historically in the law you had to demonstrate. In fact, you had to have physical marks of resistance before, and not going back that far actually, before the CPS would take, uh, take it on. So you, there had to be signs of a struggle. Well, in fact, this uh, particular uh, woman uh, of 16 didn't struggle, uh, and, and the court took the view and said every consent involves submission, but it by no means follows that every submission involves consent. And that was really a bold step for the law to make in the 80s. It didn't have the impact that we hoped, so the Sexual Offences Act 2003 was very important for putting it clearly, putting the spirit of that clearly in, in the statute. Uh, but to conclude, I haven't seen the yellow card yet. Is the yellow card <laughs> coming? Is it rising from the table? Um, to con to, uh, the red card's coming. Um, I haven't had a red card yet. So quickly, I, I really think that we need to deliver this topic 
back into the responsibility of the whole of society and the industry and each and every one of us, including policies within universities and policies with, within organisations in terms of sexual harassment. We need to make sure that whistleblowers are not victimised. We need to give a supportive atmosphere across all our environments uh, because uh, you know, the TUC, the NUS, look at any organisation, have demonstrated irrevocably that there are uh, significant percentages of women and some men uh, that actually feel harassed at work and are working in hostile environments. The city is quite shocking. I know that from friends who work in the city, the kind of banter, and that's the title of the TUC's couple of years ago document. It's only banter, it's only a joke. Uh, how many men are asked oh, I like what you're wearing today, oh, your hair's a bit different. I mean, how many politicians, unless you want to ridicule them, but I mean, Theresa May's trousers and the width of her trousers became the subject. Our bodies become the property of everybody else. Uh, and that's the start. And it's all to do as well with power, which leads, I've got the red card. There's lots more to say, but let's remember Andrea Dworkin in my last moment, and I'll come back to her, who had made an extremely important a contribution in terms of the way in which the whole industry and the media have presented women as desiring what happens to them, as being responsible and as being blamed. And this is part of the debate. Thank you. And I have had the red card. Oh. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Um I feel I've I feel I've very much fallen into this discussion around consent. Um, I was in my final year of my politics degree at the University of Bath. I'm not quite sure what I wanted to do next, and I got involved um, with the hashtag Never OK campaign. Um, I got elected as community officer, so I currently work at the Students' Union there, and I oversee student welfare uh, across campus. Um, so the Never OK campaign essentially aims to address sexual harassment and assault on campus. This is something that we've seen going on nationally across the sector as well. Um, amongst many other objectives, we've chosen to approach this <coughs> issue through delivering pro-social bystander training. It covers identifying inappropriate behaviour, how we as a campus and as a society perceive this behaviour, um, but more importantly, acknowledging the role and responsibility that we all have to play in addressing it, especially at the beginning stages, the sexism, the misogyny, the rape jokes, and as said, the banter. I'd also stress, stress how beneficial the peer-to-peer -peer element of training is um, in developing the much-needed discussions on campus on a topic that's long been ignored, denied, or brushed off by institutions at large. I'd want to start by kind of also putting this in perspective. The NUS has done you, you know, seminal work on lad culture from 2010 and 2015, um, and I, I, they are things related to um, the self-selecting surveys and their broad definitions, which doesn't really help in providing clarity on this situation, as well as providing us with a realistic picture. It plays into those who deny that this exists and says that this is just an exaggerated problem and issue. Um, this ambiguity obviously dates back right to the early 1970s when the term harassment was first used and has been a recurring issue when we discuss the Me Too movement in terms of what language we're using to discuss the behaviour. I wouldn't say that this issue is on the rise and is at epidemic levels and the rest of it. I feel like this is an issue that has consistently occurred to women and men, but women in particular since women were inducted into higher education over a century ago. Amongst many other factors, um, you know, I think social media has definitely helped in bringing this, um, bringing this to, to light. And you know, the seminal cases of Brock Turner, um, the Women's March, um, and most recently last weekend, we saw the Kavanaugh appointment. Um, I think the factors of campus, just generally, especially in Bath and at other universities, when you're on a campus uh, uni where everything is in one area, the you know the new the new exposure of freedom, the abundant alcohol, and the exceptional living nature of university campuses all lend themselves to this behaviour. And there's a lot of research to suggest that campus does affect offenders. Um, and I mean, it's not many places in life where you can be drinking before 12 and no one asks you if you have a problem. Um, nor are there any times where we live, socialize, work and study all within a 500 meter radius. I mean, it's either Freshers Hall or maybe a retirement home at best. Um, 
I think consent <coughs> classes has garnered too much negative attention. I don't think the term is used. I don't think the title is appropriate. Um, I think it's very, it's very patronizing and it's an assertion of parentalism from universities and unions across the country. Um, I think all 18 year olds are, it, it's made clear at university induction, the standard of behavior and conduct that's expected of you. All 18 year olds, irrespective of whether they're in higher education or not, um, are responsible for their actions before the law. And that should go without consent classes. Um, the targeted nature of this with your, with the lad, um, with the lads on campus and the rugby teams um, only places them on the defensive and doesn't allow them to buy into this. Um, I would struggle in, in trying to teach a concept and delivering training on a concept that's almost unteachable. It remains nuanced, contextual, and dependent on so many um, extraneous, uh, extraneous variables. Um, and the fact that training needs to be seen in the context in which the offenses happen. You're six pints down and half a gram in. Like, you're, this, is not the, this is not where we're going to, this is not where training is appropriate. To kind of finish off, I'd like to kind of redirect the conversation into the policies and procedures at universities, which are close to non-existent. Um, and the development of sex education would needs to be focusing on more positive and healthy relationships earlier on. Um, and the fact that, to end this, that I think consent classes at this stage is um, parentalism and is something that we shouldn't, we shouldn't be, we should be kind of fighting against as unions and maybe taking a different approach in order to address this issue on campus. Thank you. Elizabeth. Hi, thank you all for coming out on early Sunday morning. Uh, I am a professor of medieval literature, and I'm writing a book now on Chaucer and consent in late 14th century England. What I've learned about consent in the Middle Ages can perhaps help us come to grips with what Germaine Greer has recently called the insoluble conundrum of consent. In the Middle Ages, consent figured in both rape and marriage law and had complicated meanings. Consent is dual in nature. On the one hand, it is a public act performing crucial social, social functions, such as making marriages, forming governments, and guiding parliamentary procedure. On the other hand, it originates in an act of the soul or mind that is fundamentally in, interior, private, and ultimately indiscernible. In addition, it has both active and passive meanings, at times referring to an active event, as one of its dictionary definitions says, to agree, and at other times to a passive event, as in another one of its definitions, to comply. Historically, consent emerged in the doctrine of consent to marriage, which was articulated in theology and formulated in ecclesiastical law in the 12th century. Seeking a way to validate a marriage that did not involve sexual intercourse, that of Mary and Joseph, theologians declared a marriage legitimate through the exchange of words of consent alone. This empowering doctrine ultimately allowed individuals to choose their own marriage partners, even if those choices conflicted with the desires of the parents, local lord, or king. This doctrine also aff affirms a fundamentally important idea that each person, whether male or female, has an autonomous and legitimate soul. This assumption, as Mary Wollstonecraft recognized in the 18th century, ultimately provides the foundation for the development of women's rights. Consent also played a, a role in cases of rape, which was called raptus in the Middle Ages, but sometimes in surprising ways. Like consent, raptus, which in a general definition simply means seizure, has a fluid meaning. On one end of the spectrum, it could refer to violent sexual assault, and on the other, to abduction for the purposes of marriage with the consent of the woman involved. There were occasions, oddly, when a woman's consent resulted in a charge of rape being brought against her. That is, a woman who consented to be abducted by the man she loved could be charged in the courts with rape. This confusion undercut the resiliency of non-consent in the law concerning sexual assault and perhaps contributes to the ambiguous status it holds in the law today. The ambiguity of the meaning of the term raptus also lies at the heart of our ability to interpret the by now, I, I don't know if it's notorious to you, but it is in my circles, document, which tells us that in 1380, Cecily Champagne released 
the canonical author Geoffrey Chaucer from the charge of Raptus. We have in the case of Chaucer yet another example of a man in power, indeed someone who was once a member of parliament being accused of rape. Whatever Chaucer may or may not have done, remember all we know is that he was released from a charge of Raptus. His writing shows extraordinary insight into the important role consent can play in the development of healthy sexual relationships. If I were to teach a class in consent, my first assignment would be to read Chaucer's visionary tale about rape, The Wife of Bath's Tale. In that tale, you may recall, a knight who raped a maiden is given the chance of saving his life if he can find out within a year what it is that women want. <laughs> this pu punishment is the first visionary aspect of the tale, for what the knight rapist is forced to learn is what he failed to recognize when he raped the maiden, that women are not objects, but subjects. He also learns that when women have not one, but many, sometimes contradictory and often changeable desires, which can only be ascertained by asking. An old hag who in return for his, for his promise to marry her gives the knight the life-saving answer that women want sovereignty and power. The hag then gives him a choice that she be either old and ugly but forever faithful or young and beautiful but faithless. Only after reluctantly giving her the power to choose for them both does the knight get his heart's desire, a beautiful, faithful wife. <laughs> this second visionary aspect of the tale teaches us that sexual relationships always involve negotiations of power, but even more profoundly, that being willing to give up power in such negotiations serves not only women, but men as well. The tale teaches us then that the articulation of consent can lead to mutually beneficial sexual relationships for both women and even the most unregenerate of men. Consent classes could offer us the chance to discover and articulate our own des desires and to learn to recognize the ways in which our interaction with various forms of power shapes those desires. Reading Chaucer's visionary tale of rape can help us invent punishments that rather than reproducing violence can reform rape culture and furthermore to recognize how negotiations of consent can yield harmonious relationships. We need, of course, to go much further to address the larger intersecting ideologies of masculinity, homosociality, and capitalism that reduce women to objects. I am not sure how we can undo the knot that produces rape culture. Perhaps we can begin, however, by talking about it. Thank you. So um, when I was at school, sex education amounted to, well, I think we began with daffodils, and we drew um, cross-sections of daffodils and labelled, and I'm probably going to uh, reveal my terrible ignorance here. I think it was like sepal and stamen or something like that, <laughs> and we progressed from daffodils. Eventually, we worked our way all the way up to the human body and labelled various parts, and it continued in that very scientific and biological vein, and that was it. Um, obviously, that was many years ago now, but it's now assumed that sex education must do far more than this, that sex education must um, cover relationships. It's actually being renamed as not just, first of all, it was sex and relationships education. Now it's actually called relationships and sex education. Um, interestingly, um, with the new guidance that's coming in, primary schools are allowed to opt out of the sex part of sex education, but not the relationships part of relationships education. <coughs> that actually strikes me as a bit weird because um, I think children do need to know about biology. And I think actually knowing about body parts and um, how sexual reproduction occurs is a really important and useful thing. And yet primary schools, not secondary, but primary, are being allowed to opt out of that. Um, but they are definitely having to stick to teaching about relationships. Um, 
So you kind of fast forward more years than I care to think, and we're at a situation where consent classes are assumed to be the norm. It's assumed that you can teach about relationships, and we should teach about relationships. And when people criticise the idea of consent classes, so the, it seems to me that really the only dominant opposition to consent classes is this idea, as, as I think we've heard on the panel today, that, that they're somehow inadequate, that they don't go far enough, that we need to bring about a broader cultural change, that we need to start at an ever younger age. But, but I want to just first pose the question, um, why are we, why is it that in a very short space of time we've reached this point where it's considered normal and appropriate to start teaching about relationships? Um, why have we started talking about consent to such an extent that, uh, as Sally mentioned in the, the discussion on rape yesterday, um, consent became the main focus and how we can better teach about consent, how we can make sure people are more informed um, in, in this way of thinking. And I will lay my cards on the table at the outset. I think this is in response to a panic. And I think we, when we start using phrases like rape culture to describe a university campus, I think the Me Too discussion around sexual harassment, I think we're in the grip of a panic. I mean, I have spent far more time over the course of the past decade on a university campus than I care to admit. And the idea that the university campus is a rape culture, well, I would laugh and I would say it was ridiculous, only it's far more serious than that. It's um, putting fear in the hearts of young women before they ever get to university that they're going to be confronted by this barrage of sexual harassment leading all the way up to rape. It's becoming um, widespread nowadays, this assumption that to be a woman is to be abused, is to be harassed, is to um, have predatory males lying in wait for you, that the whole experience of womanhood is bound up in sexual harassment and sexual abuse. The NUS research was described as seminal. The NUS research is not worth reading. Um, it was rubbish, you know, you, you kind of made the point that um, this is self-selecting and very small sample sizes, but these are actually really important points. We are using statistics to manipulate young women into being afraid. Um, when you start talking about banter as being a form of sexual harassment, you're trivialising real incidents of sexual harassment that might occur. Um, we are making definitions so all-encompassing to, to just include anything that might occur. And like I said, this, this, the consequences of this are dangerous. We are enculturating young women into a, a, a fear of something that is very unlikely to actually happen to them. And I have to say, this is my number one reason for being against consent classes. They promote a fear that's out of all proportion to the reality. They tell young women in particular <coughs> that rape is a normal part of life, that rape comes about by not saying the right words, um, not conducting yourself in the right way, or, or the partner, your partner doesn't conduct him or herself in the right way prior to a sexual encounter. And it encourages young women in particular to reassess um, sex that they might have had, either drunk sex or regretted sex or unwanted sex, and interpret this as if they've been raped. And I think that's incredibly unhelpful, incredibly debilitating, especially for young women. Um, and yet we've got this really tricky situation where consent clearly is a complex issue. The very fact that we're sitting here talking about it now, the fact that it came up in the rape discussion yesterday, there's clearly something to talk about here. And yet, on the other hand, you have these kind of internet memes that I'm sure everyone's seen where consent is compared to kind of cups of tea and slices of cake. And we're told this is really easy. You know, you wouldn't ram some cake down someone's throat without asking them. And hey, consent is just like that. You can think, well, if it's so easy and it's so straightforward and so obvious, why are we running classes on this? Um, you know, it just strikes me as a bit bizarre. 
Um, I think the whole point of the class is it is about redefining rape. When I was at university, so I'd moved beyond drawing daffodils by that stage, but when I was at <coughs> university, it was the no means no campaign. And, you know, I think there were certain problems with that, but at heart there was an idea that a woman was authoritative, that she was in control of her own mind, that she knew what she thought, and that more than anything else, she was quite capable of saying no. When we move towards um, the consent class, and particularly the focus on affirmative consent, I think we lose all those positive aspects. And instead, we have the idea of a passive woman who's waiting <coughs> to be asked. Um, I think it promotes the idea that, that there are certain words that, that you need to almost incant, almost like a prayer that will protect you from sexual harassment. Um, and as I've said, I think it makes people reassess and look back and think, well, did I say those words? Was I asked in that particular way? Sorry, Sally, just two more points then. Um, one thing I think, again, really important point, the, the assumption that there are right and wrong ways to conduct relationships, the idea that there are some of us who have magical special insight into what is a good way to conduct relationships. So, you know, we've, we've talked about Love Island, um, and we, we should not be encouraging the types of relationships on Love Island. Well, I'm really sorry, but lots of people do like the types of relationships that are on Love Island. Lots of people like participating in those kinds of relationships. Relationships. Lots of people like watching those kinds of relationships. And why not? I don't think there's a special subsection of society that has unique insight into the right way um, to conduct a relationship. So to sum up, my final argument is that I think consent classes are a response to fear, a response to panic. But the problem is the consent classes only make things worse because they promote fear and they promote panic. Rather, they can never solve the problem that they identify because the problem they identify does not exist. Okay. Thank you. So we've had some interesting range of opinions here. Over to you. Please indicate if you would, would like to say anything. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes, I think so. Uh, OK. Um, I found that absolutely uh, fascinating. and I found something to agree with, with everybody um, on, the, on the panel, even though, you know, Joanna was very much at odds, it seems, with every, everybody else. Uh, but I sort of agreed with everybody as I was going along. But w what I'd like to mention is something that happened on the way here, an extraordinary thing, because I'm quite an old guy now, and I've never seen uh, before the kind of uh, harassment that has been uh, talked about. Believe it or not, I must have been perhaps going around with my, my eyes shut, I, I, I don't know. But getting out at Barbican Station today, um, there was something where I wonder whether I should have uh, intervened. Um, and I, you know, I'd like your, your reaction to it, because getting out at Barbican Station and just going up towards the, the station entrance, um, there was a guy uh, walking up, as I thought, with uh, a young woman uh, to, to get to the, uh, the entrance. Uh, but then, uh, and I thought that this, there was something that was just a, sort of part of the relationship. Uh, the, the guy sort of whacks on the bottom uh, the, the, the woman, as I thought, that he, that he was with. Uh, but then, uh, just, just carrying on, I saw that she sort of moved away from him, and um, uh, he started swaying a bit, and I thought, oh, you know, he's obviously drunk, it's a bit early on a Sunday morning, but you know, I just wonder uh, what I should have done. Should I have intervened? Should I have said anything? Should the woman herself have reacted? She didn't. She didn't even look behind when this happened. Okay. Listening to all the panel, there does seem to be um, something you're all saying about the uh, moral responsibility of each individual to understand what they want from a relationship and how they want to manage that relationship and be able to uh, find out what women want, what men want from that, um, and, and that being what consent uh, in its ideal form and, and, and how you would like to see it happen. But at the same time, say, Alicia, for you then saying, I, I think that, but then saying there should be much more policies and procedures 
in university around these things. And I just wonder how you would conceive that happening, because you can see how you can enforce policies and procedures in a workplace. It's a, it's, it, it's a, a formalised um, particular institution. Mm -hmm. Universities seem to me not that. So I, I would like to know more how you would develop. Thank you. I, I think um, if, if you walk up to a stranger, um, slap that person on the backside, um, you, I'm not sure consent classes is going to help you much. I mean, it, I think most people know that that's probably wrong. So I, I don't know what aspect of, of consent classes would help. I, I just, I can't help but think listening to this that it reminds me a little bit of the character of Julia in 1984 with her chastity belt and the idea that sex is suddenly, it's something that, that you're supposed to feel guilty about and it's something that you're, you're supposed to see as impure. Um, and I think the end result of this will be that men and women stop enjoying sex and I'm, I'm not, just not sure that that is a good way forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I think this point kind of shows the problem that we're facing here. The fact that, uh, with all due respect, someone can go their whole lives without experiencing something that in my life is so absolutely pervasive all the time. Um, I can a answer why she didn't do anything, and it's because we are frankly terrified of responding to this kind of harassment because there have been violent instances. I have been involved in violent instances myself. And usually when that happens, the question is, why did you react? Why didn't you just walk away? So it's kind of this like conundrum of what we would do. Um, and when you say everyone would understand that this is wrong, the exact point is that a lot of people don't. And there is this social experiment going around in social media. I know if you've seen it, but this professor stood in front of a whole class and said, OK, I want you guys to tell me, what do you do every day when you wake up and through your daily life to avoid being sexually harassed or raped? Most guys said, um, I don't do anything. And I encourage you guys to ask the women in your lives, because most of us do a lot of things to avoid that. And it's a, a something that's pervasive. And that's why we talked about rape culture. And that's, I think, the, the point that, Joanna, your argument is missing, is that it ignores this fact of culture. It is not specific instances that are isolated. <coughs> it is a whole system that allows these instances to happen, that allow a guy to go through the subway and do these things thinking, rightfully so, that he can get away with it, because he can. And so, okay. when, when we talk about the culture, I think it's important to understand that consent classes might not directly reach this person, but it will reach enough people so that this concept is not normalized. So yes, indeed, it's a redefinition of what we consider rape, because rape, it, in its worst form, it is this violent instance, but there's a lot of milder forms of harassment that we also need to tackle. Okay, I mean, I've got a question a, a little bit myself, uh, which is um, sometimes I go to work and my colleague, who's male, a new suit on or something, and I say, oh, that's a nice suit. Is that banter that's, r that's wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay, this person here. Can he, yeah. Um, so you have addressed this idea that microaggressions, um, the little things, um, ta have taken over public um, debate and have uh, drawn attention to those microaggressions to the detriment of um, the actual stuff that is happening. And I do agree with that uh, to that extent. And I do agree that consent classes um, take away agency from women. Um, but the fact remains that those little things, they might not affect me long term, but they are very annoying and tiring. They are exhausting. Um, so how, how do you propose we address them? Because I'd really rather not have them happening. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Actually, I, I'm going to respond to one or two of the questions. I agree with some elements of everything everybody's said on the panel, and I'm going to try and link some of my responses. I want to start, first of all, with a gentleman who who, um, and I think quite rightly pointed out as well by somebody in the audience, um, who said, well, look, I live in a world where this hasn't happened, and it, it, it ha actually happened this morning. And I think part of 
consent classes. And I abhor the term, as you do, Alicia, uh, because I think it trivialises and it's patronising and all of that. Um, I think what's, what's important is in all of this that our consciousnesses are raised. And, and your consciousness has been raised. And what should you do about it? I think that's the start. And that's the start for, uh, I think, uh, students and people in universities and everywhere else where we're trying to politicise um, an individual experience for some which is embedded and culturally embedded in, in a society with, with a, a sort of note of entertainment or a note of acceptance. We can't get away from the fact, so where did this start? One of the panellists said, where did it start from? Why are we talking about it? Another of the panellists talked about negotiations of power, and that's at the centre of what we're talking about, I think, negotiations of power, and culture is at the centre of it, and that's the very important thing. And I think if we look at the rise in rape uh, complaints to the police, and those are the complaints that the police have recorded. So anybody from rape crisis, I'm very sorry if I'm minimising this, but they have risen to 40,000 uh, complaints to the police. Rape crisis would say many more, uh, because, of course, many women don't report to the police. And I think this gives us an indication, because at 90%, and I don't think we can quibble with those statistics, I accept some statistics are self-selected. I do accept that, of course. In fact, most of the studies are microcosms, and so they are studies which could be critiqued. But the statistics on 90% uh, we know of rape happen as because it's somebody that you know. So the negotiation's gone wrong. Either the woman's gone wrong, I'm going to blame the woman. Yes, the, the, either the woman has made the mistake or the man has made the mistake. So I'll level it out, but it's gone wrong. So I think somewhere it has gone wrong. And that is important. I also want to bring in negotiations of power, the cultural question here, that the President's Club, I think, gives us an example of how women are coerced into particular situations. If it was not for that on-the-wall fly journalist, fly on the wall, we perhaps wouldn't have known that this huge charitable men's only event that raised a lot of money uh, for a lot of important charities and did a lot of important work was actually a microcosm of the macrocosm of actually coercive behavior where women had to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements and if you've seen a non-disclosure agreement, you know, you think, God, yes, I'll sign it to say nothing about the kind of behaviour that went on, that they had to wear these mini dresses with matching underwear, short, and all the rest of it, a very unpleasant atmosphere within. And it's astonishing. So it, what's happening is perhaps there's not more of it, and I agree, perhaps there's not more of it. The fact is that we are actually now uh, talking about it and raising the questions, and I think that that's extremely, extremely important. And of course, the gentleman who said, let's, you know, can't we enjoy sex? Of course we can enjoy sex, but this, this is a very important topic for men, for women. I have two daughters, I don't have a son, but I mean, if I had a son, I would be equally concerned about these kind of, these kind of issues. So I think, you know, m my point is that we need to, to look at it within the cultural context of the way in which increasingly, I mean, I've watched over the years, having written Sex and Gender, talked about pornography, the way in which it's just commonplace. And I think we have to address that as well. Okay, okay. Alicia? Um, just to, uh, to answer your question at the, uh, at the front, in terms of the university's response, um, my main thing is their reporting avenues. Um, many, some universities do them really well, um, but many of them don't, and many students are unaware of where they need to report. And then secondly is the support that we offer the victim as well as the accused. Um, many universities don't have any policies and procedures in place, and it's done on a very ad hoc basis. Um, and that's something that I am addressing at the University of Bath, but also something that we need to address across the sector. And UUK has come out with reports, um, but I feel like it doesn't address um, sexual harassment and sexual assault specifically. It addresses discipline areas across the board, and that goes from anything. Um, and, that, and that's just kind of like right across the spectrum. I, I would like um, a discussion about what we're doing to address sexual violence specifically on campus. That's what I meant by um, the policies and procedures. Um, to the gentleman um, at the back over there, um, personally, I would have intervened mainly because it's a Sunday morning and maybe because I'm a female and I have that in me to go and say, hey, are you okay? Um, 
but I wouldn't I wouldn't have called out the man mainly because he was drunk. <laughs> um, but that that's how I would approach that situation. Um, and just generally on a topic of culture, I think that the, whole, the approach that I kind of am for in terms of bystander is addressing all of these small behaviors and trying to bring us all along, both men and women, um, because I think we both have a joint responsibility to address the, the smaller behaviors. Um, and and in doing so, hopefully addressing more core offenders and uh, people who facilitate such behavior. Oh, there's so many things I'd like to say, yeah, but to address them all. Um, what, one thing, I, I don't really understand why consciousness should lead to fear. I, I think that becoming conscious of our behavior and thinking of our motivations and being able to articulate them is a, um, a positive act. And I certainly don't think that talking about sex should get in the way of enjoyment of sex. I think talk can be very pleasurable. Um, but I, I wanted to m move a little bit away from negotiations of power, which I raised, I think, we do need to think about how power works and why power makes people sexually attractive. But um, I think also we need to broaden our perspective and think about economics and how economics plays into this. And I just wanted to say that I had the most moving experience coming here uh, with an Uber cab driver who was from Niger Nigeria. He asked me what I was doing here and I told him about the consent um, classes and the discussion and. I thought about what's happening in Nigeria, and I thought he must think that I'm mad to be talking about this. But he actually was really engaged, and he asked so many questions. And he told me about the situation in Nigeria, where it's not that women are, are being forced uh, to have sex all the time. Rather, they themselves stand on the street corner and beg men to take them in because they are desperately poor. And the minimum wage is so low that they simply cannot survive. And these are university students who are trying to just get through their daily life. And I think, um, from you know, from my position, I think it's really important to look at larger structures of economics and of uh, power differentials. And so, unfortunately, it's a very big topic. Consent classes seem to me a way to start, and consciousness raising seems to me crucial. There Thank you. Go. So um, part of living in a, a society with other people, part of being a student on a university campus, perhaps with 16, 20,000 other students, is that we engage daily in interaction with people who we do not know, do not choose to interact with. We, we brush up against people. Sometimes, literally, we brush up against people. If you take the tube during rush hour. As part of living in a society, people look at us, people talk to us, we hear jokes, <coughs> we hear other things that we perhaps don't want to hear. We might hear whistling, we might see people winking. And then we have a choice. You know, we can either decide this whistling, this winking, this looking, this staring, this brushing up against me, you know, this is all so exhausting, all these microaggressions, you know, this is just, my life is unbearable. Or we can decide, do you know what, this is part and parcel of living in a free society. This is part and parcel of interacting spontaneously with other people. And I think making that decision is actually really important because for me, and I think actually from feminists of a previous era, the freedoms that come with living in a free society of being able to engage and interact with other people spontaneously are actually freedoms that are worth celebrating. They're really important freedoms. And I think feminism is moving away from that celebration of women's freedom and it's actually setting back the clock in the most disastrous way possible because it's not, you know, when we, we talk about this discussion around consent, it's not on about even bringing in regulations in the public sphere. It's about regulating the private sphere. It's about regulating the mind. It's about regulating how we think about each other, our internal life. And it's moving into trying to control how we think in relation to each other. And I think we need to work out, you know, what do we lose? What do we sacrifice when we do this? And to me, we sacrifice spontaneity. We sacrifice our freedom. <coughs> 
we sacrifice intimacy <coughs> and the potential to forge intimate, spontaneous, genuinely loving, free relationships with other people. And to me, that's a sacrifice that is not worth making for, for the sake of somebody not touching your bum on a Sunday morning coming out of the Barbican station. Not pleasant, you know, and I'm not going to sit here and be completely naive and Pollyanna-ish and pretend things like this never happen. Or if they do, you know, we should just say, ha ha, you know, that happened. Not pleasant. But, you know, do we want to sacrifice so much for the, the, the opportunity to make sure that never happens again? Which, incidentally, I don't think we can do. Okay. Thank you. All right, so there's some time for more uh, discussion from you. Questions, comments? Yeah, I've got a 16-year-old son and um, kind of worried about how he feels about approaching girls and stuff like that. Um, particularly now very much, they're talking about consent a lot at schools and at universities, as everyone said, that um, you're, what you do, the negotiation you have with girls, has got to fit into this very, very tight did she say yes, did I say, I did I ask her? Um, and if it doesn't fit into that very, very tight definition of it's all right, um, then it's a toxic relationship. You know, it's a toxic negotiation. And that slightly worries me, because I know he's already worried about talking to girls, as all kids his age <laughs> are, and now he's actually scared of it. You know, he, he's you know, actually scared of doing it. He said to his dad, can you teach me to talk to girls? Um, and I, I think that this is really, really, really dreadful. You know, um, I was reading a book by a, 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 an American person called Jean Twenge. And she said that in America, and it was about iGen generation, she said in America, they talk about uh, relationships. They don't want relationships. And they talk about relationships as catching feelings. And as if catching, like catching a cold or catching measles, you know, it's a disease. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is really worrying. And I think you know, the people on the panel who uh, uh, raised the whole point of intimacy, it's really dreadful that I think my kids are going to be denied the real pleasure of intimacy, you know, because they're too scared to actually do anything. So um, anyway, I think it's very serious. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Just... Uh, Ask the panel whether they believe that relationships can be taught. So I was never taught relationships. I mean, you have a relationship with somebody, be that you know any kind of relationship, a relationship between a uh, you know a child and a parent, you know, uh, uh, yeah, with a with a partner. You don't, you can't. Personally, I don't believe you can be you can be taught them. Uh, I, I'm very so I'd be very suspicious about um, any kind of relationship education. I, really don't think, I think you have to kind of learn through doing. And I think in some ways the learning through doing is how you find the parameters of consent as well. Um, and, um, and then in that context, I can see that, you know, uh, uh, an outlook which kind of disempowers people, make, makes them believe that they, they can't act autonomously, I think then can make them mistake, you know, unfortunate experiences as, uh, uh, as in some way... <laughs> uh, 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 you know, very negative, rather than their finding the parameters of parameters of consent. That was my husband, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that he the passed the my pleasure. microphone along. It's <laughs> <laughs> very good, which I mean, definitely think it's very good now. Hi, I just wanted to talk about office banter. Um, I worked in the city for five years across three different companies, and I absolutely do not recognise your definition of banter. Um, my experience is it was one of the most fun parts of my job. Long hours, often dull work. Banter is what kept people going. And w women were not singled out. It was towards women, it was towards men, men to women, women to men. Um, you know, there were jokes that some people found offensive, but it just, it was, there just wasn't this misogyny that, that you, you're describing. And, you know, to do away with banter for me is just unthinkable. I think it's a very important part of uh, office life. Okay, thank you. Uh, John, I think what you're talking about is we sort of run the risk of inviting lawmakers back into our bedrooms. 
And I wonder, legally speaking, I understand we have a legal system which is a bit, a bit broken and we have to prove that we've been raped. But if we flip that legal system, do we run the risk of opening the floodgates of, of um, incrementally infringing all of our civil liberties if we lock someone up for winking at us on the street? Right now, that seems like we're trying to control something. Down the line, is that quite dystopian for us? Um, and my second question, we're, we're sort of talking about a pervasive level of, uh, a pervasive threat against women. But some of it doesn't quite ring true to me because statistically speaking, you are more likely to be violently attacked as a man walking home than you are as a woman being raped walking home. And these conversations often whitewash men out of it. We sort of pretend that women are afraid and vulnerable and we forget that actually men are as afraid, if not more, and vulnerable. So why aren't we broadening this discussion out to pervasive violence and threat against mm -hmm. all of society? Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I broadly agree with Joanna today and the, the lady at the back who made that comment. I think the problem is that we're still, it's, we're told that with feminism that you know men and women can be equal and yet we're still raising boys and men and girls and women differently. Um, boys and men still raised with that sense of entitlement and being assertive. You know, if you, t if you ask a boy or a man to do something that they don't like doing, they can easily say no. When it comes to girls and women, we're still teaching them. I don't know that there's this big victimhood culture that we're not teaching women to be assertive enough. And that's part of the problem that we have, that, you know, they're not being taught to be assertive enough to say no, to stand up for themselves. We're told that constantly there will be victims of X, Y, and Z in the future. Um, and also, I think, uh, sorry, I forgot your name there. Um, you were talking about... Um, Me? Yeah, yeah. S Susan. Susan. You are talking about um, male colleagues complimenting um, what women are wearing in the office. I personally like that. I don't have a problem <laughs> with it. I like it when both men and women compliment my style. It's very flattering. Um, you know, I came across a male colleague who said to me, at the risk of an HR complaint, um, <laughs> your, your outfit's very nice today. And I felt really bad for him because he was, you know, kind of sweating, you know, beads of sweat on his forehead and he really didn't want to say a compliment to me. But I didn't mind. I think I can see there's a line that can be easily crossed. Um, but another point, just very quickly, um, I go dancing every couple of weeks and um, I came across a man who was very, very inappropriate. Um, and, you know, I basically told him to, you know, get lost and I stood up for myself. And um, there was a table by the side. And um, when I went there, they all stood up and started applauding. And they said, good for you. Finally, someone stood up to him. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, he's one of those guys. He's here. He's a regular. He's constantly harassing women. He's touching them in an inappropriate way. And nobody says anything. And you finally stood up and said something. And I just thought, why did it take so long for someone to stand up and say no to this guy? And I understand that sometimes, as a woman, there's a risk that you can be assaulted, especially if the guy is stronger than you. But, you know, I think we should it shouldn't take for that long for someone to stand up for themselves, really. OK, thank you. Uh, just on the idea of, like, um, consent talks on campus, because I'm a university student, and so I think it's well known that university students go out two, three times a week, sort of on nights out. And I was just wondering, like, how useful the panel actually thinks they are on, like, situations students are likely to find themselves in. Because, like, if I'm going out, am I meant to, like, if I'm at clubbing, am I meant to shout at a girl across the club, is it okay if I touch you? Because that's just not practical <laughs> in any way at all. So, it's like, so do, do you think, like, if the tracks from people being spontaneous and like, having that sort of experience? Okay, thank you. One of the things for me, um, so I just graduated from university and the men's rugby club at my university were banned because of their conduct towards women. Um, and so I kind of went through my degree with this idea of consent classes. And I think... Being around other women, kind of at a university age, what I actually thought would have been more useful was not telling men how to not harass women, but actually empowering women in their own sexuality. I was quite uh, kind of shocked at the amount of women that would go home with a guy on a night out and would not really care that she was like the secondary partner in it, would just sort of like lie back and think of England and think that was great. And I think we need to empower young women to think that having sex is with, you know, in a safe consensual environment is a good thing and it's something that we should encourage instead of kind of creating this idea of victimhood and that every time you go on a night out you're going to be harassed. Actually 
letting women kind of make their own decisions and if they want to go home with someone, know that their sexuality and their own empowerment is just as important as any man's. I don't know, I just kind of felt like, from my experience, I found more women who were accepting of being passive, even to their boyfriends, and not really being bothered that they were they kind of weren't orgasming as much as their partner was. That was more of a problem I found at university than anyone kind of being groped in the street. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna very quickly go to the concept, a very um, disturbing concept of microaggressions. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I don't care for obscene comments, but I can, I am equipped to deal with them. Uh, what, I'm, what, I'm, what I don't want to have to deal with is people touching me. This is not okay. Comment laugh, joke, speak over me. I can deal with that. I can raise my voice. What I don't like is being groped in a club or on the public transport. And I can speak up against that, but somehow it's not doing anything. Not in the long run. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask um, how you think we should teach men and who should teach men uh, how to behave. I went to an all-boys boarding school, so I'm not sure I, if I spoke to a girl until I was about 19. But uh, <laughs> uh, I, was, I was lucky enough to ha have a father. And there's been a decline in fatherhood, I think, uh, quite significantly in the last 50 years. And who should teach men? Who's, whose job is that? Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention, uh, what do you think about this um, idea that so there's quite a, a stigma around being socially conscious? For instance, especially in you know a academic institutions like college and university. So, <laughs> if I'm you know with my male friends and they say something that um, I'm not comfortable with or make comments about my body or something, and I say, well, actually, you know, can you not? <coughs> um, the first thing that I'm I'm being told is, oh, you know, stop being so you know socially anal, stop being you know so uptight. And I think there's this shame around girls speaking out or saying, actually, when you, you know, started moving on me and groping me at that party, I get that you think there is this barrier between us because it's just, you know, friendly banter, but um, that I shouldn't be shamed for, you know, standing up and saying, oh, actually, <laughs> I'm not comfortable with that. And I think there is a lot of that, this idea that, um, you know, there's a lack of validation in saying, oh, I'm not okay with that. Okay, thank you. Okay, who should teach men? I think consent classes come up with the idea that at large everyone <coughs> is responsible for teaching both men and women both how not to harass and how to stand up for themselves. And quite frankly, when you're worried about your son, my little brother, I, am, I was raised in Latin America. Trust me, we have zero talk about consent there. He's still scared a lot <laughs> of talking to women. I would say it has nothing to do with the climate. It has more to do with purity and how it's scary to just you know, start a relationship, start a conversation. And if, as a man, you feel so threatened by this concept of, wow, the woman has to say yes to what I'm saying, so much so that you're not able to establish a relationship, I'm so sorry but that is your problem. And if you wanna know how to do it properly, ask your women around you, ask your mom, ask your friends, Does this, is this appropriate? Like, how do you feel when you do this? And that's the whole thing. And I'm shocked to hear that female empowerment sexually is being phrased as something that is diminished by these consent classes because I feel like a lot of the problem is with this slut shaming or this not allowing a woman to be a sexual being and I've, I had this experience, because again, Latin America, more conservative context, of feeling like I cannot say no and feeling I cannot say yes either, because sex is such a taboo thing in a conservative environment. Um, so ask women around you, it's okay. I've had great sex, consensual, it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think, it is, I think it is very interesting that a lot of the uh, discussion, I think it came out in the conversation yesterday as well, around consent classes seems to be almost how do you conduct a relationship and is that something my question is that something that can be taught and can it be taught should it be taught at schools and universities so i think that's one of the one of the themes uh, i'm going to the panel want to come back very briefly to some of the points there'll be a little bit more time then uh, for you so who wants to go first yeah 
Um, on occasions like this, I'm always very reluctant to start um, talking about men. <laughs> um, I'm particularly <coughs> reluctant to start saying that men are somehow victims as well, and we need to feel just as sorry for men as we do for women, and men have problems too. So I don't like going down that line, but I, <laughs> I'm the mother of a 19-year-old boy and a 17-year-old boy, and I completely recognize the points that you're making. So with my own boys, with all the friends that they bring back into the house, you know, I see very shy, very nervous um, boys who have been used to, from day one of primary school, girls completely outshining them in the academic sphere, girls being bold and bolshy, and boys not quite knowing what to do, how to handle this, and, and how they're supposed to conduct themselves. Now, girls, if you don't see that in boys, I suggest that boys and girls and young men and young women actually need to talk to each other a whole heap more. So the um, guy at the back there was saying about being to an all boys school, you know, but I, actually listening to everybody here today, it seems like it's nothing really to do with single sex schools. It seems like there's people living into completely separate worlds where young women are growing up with this sense that men are all out to get them and young men are growing up with this sense that women are um, intimidating and they don't know quite what to do, actually getting out of the bedrooms, putting the phones away, putting the laptops away, and actually communicating with each other outside of the sphere of the consent class and the relationships class, actually just spontaneously hanging out, interacting, would probably solve a lot of these problems. I mean, my view is, and this final point I'll make this time, you know, I think young women are very, very assertive. Young women today scare me. Young women today are incredibly assertive in my experience. The tragic thing is that the only thing they are assertive about is the extent of their own victimhood and how hard it is to be a woman and how terrible and abu how, how abused they are. So take that assertiveness and go out there and talk to people people, interact with people and make your mark on the world rather than just having a go at how terrible it is. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, the first thing, how do we learn about relationships? I'm a professor of literature. There's an awful lot we can learn from reading literature and I recommend reading a lot more novels and talking about them. I totally agree that talking about uh, many things is extremely important. And I think it's very important to get away from victimhood. I think victimhood is just actually serves the system that produces victims. I think, I think we need to be able to stand up for ourselves and be much more assertive than we are. I did want to say something about freedom and having a choice, which was something that you raised. I, we live in a culture, a regulatory culture, and part of the thing, the mystery of consent is this interior state that it is. How is that state regulated? Who is regulating our insides? I think it's hard to say. We live in a culture of surveillances of many different kinds, and I think to say that it's uh, spontaneous to be able to just, um, uh, you know, that would be impinging on spontaneity to have regulations about consent actually gets in the way of the question of who has a choice, when do you have a choice, how are choices determined, what kind of um, advertising and cultural predispositions uh, shape the way we have choices. So I think we have a lot more to say about how choice works. Okay. Um, Alicia, do you want to um, just uh, on a couple of points, I do think there are certain elements of relationships which can be taught, I think, especially when you're young and you're navigating your first relationships. There's a very, very fine line between something that is abusive, which is toxic, and people don't realize it. And I think that that's something that can be brought out, maybe not necessarily through training, but just through an understanding of like support and awareness about certain things, especially when you see things on, online about like possessiveness being seen as a form of love. It's not. That's not healthy. Um, and I think in terms of 
uh, like this broader discussion. I think it's more the the small interactions that we need to be addressing, which I think can be taught. Um, I totally take your point to the lady at the back in terms of female sexuality. I think that that's a, such a huge problem on university campuses, um, where female sexuality is just completely ignored and you just kind of lie back and take it. Um, and then in terms of to toxic masculinity and, and all of that discussion, I think that there is a huge you know, thing that needs to be discussed um, uh, amongst men in terms of their entitlement and the whole assertiveness thing, but also the fact that the more women you sleep with, the more of like a lad you are, the more, like you have something to prove. Um, that's something that need, just needs to be addressed. So on, on both ends, um, we can be having a, a more frank and open discussion around sex. Um, and I would hate for things to ha take away from spontaneity and the general day-to-day -day interactions. Um, the mention of the 16-year-old, um, as well as like you know young uh, young boys. Um, and I think that that comes down to Joanna's point of communication. Um, I'm originally from India, and I grew up around the Middle East. There was no communication about this. There was no frank discussion. And I value it, and I see the importance of it um, in uh, making our interactions between genders better and healthier and more pleasurable for all. Thank you. Okay. Well, well thank you to everybody um, for your fantastic contributions. And it just shows the sort of diversity of opinion, uh, as, as is a diversity on the panel there is out there, and everybody's been absolutely frank. And I can't set myself up in any way as an expert to answer some of the uh, more difficult questions. Uh, but I think some of you together c can afterwards um, actually speak about what advice should be given to men and how should men be socialised and how should we deal with, with our sons if we have them, etc. Uh, but I want to go back and I want to just now frame myself perhaps as a feminist uh, and a cultural theorist and my, uh, as well as a lawyer. And my major concern, of course, is with the, c the ongoing cultural representation, which is even more invidious and pervasive than it's ever been. We're not just talking about the representation of, of women in literature or in, in books or in particular pictorial images. It's all over the web and everywhere. Uh, and I think we've got something that we need to address in terms of the, L the representation of the LBGT community in this wider debate as well. But going back to what we're all trying to look for is actually the empowerment of a particular group, which happens to be uh, women that have been historically disempowered. And we're looking at that through the gender pay gap and in various ways. And this is part of a much broader discussion so that we can bring everybody up. It's an ideal world, it's a nirvana, to a state where we all have uh, better equality in everything that we do in our lives. How do we treat each other? That was one of the questions. Obviously, with respect, uh, with, with dignity, with listening to one another. Um, but I obviously... We can't ignore the fact that the Weinstein, I mean, you know, how were those women? Look at the industry. We, we can't ignore that very powerful <coughs> women in a very powerful industry were obviously silenced. Cosby's, the, the women that Cosby uh, assaulted, or Jimmy Savile. I mean, it's actually sh demonstrating to us that although I accept your point, you know, you didn't experience it in various institutions, uh, there are various levels of, of sexual assault, which starts somewhere. Okay. But the very important question that was asked by somebody, you know, are we going to legalise against various types of behaviour? Um, well, of course we're not, but I think we have to recognise, looking at the law, that actually the law has taken a step. Why has it? And it's taken a step over coercion. We've got a recent piece of legislation that actually criminalises coercive conduct, and it's very difficult to, to define what that is, and it's specifically within a family or an intimate relationship, and not actually perhaps within us here. But I think, you know, the law is recognising that, that coercion does form a systematic part of how, how we live. And just to move it into to, to domestic violence, if you like, uh, there are areas of coercion. Uh, strangulation is one, and we can all see non-fatal strangulation, the image of uh, Saatchi with Nigella Lawson telling the court, explaining why he took her by the neck and held her like this, explaining, I was just trying to get her to focus. Now, you know, OK, that's just one incident. But, I mean, perhaps this is systematic when we recognise that a fifth of all domestic violence homicides are... Well, a fifth, sorry, let me rephrase. A fifth of all homicides irrespective of the relationship of victim to suspect, whether it's knife crime or whatever it is, are actually perpetrated against female suspects. 
So actually, you know, consent and sexual relationships, and of course, domestic violence involves sexual assault. Sorry. It's, it's a wider thing, and there are some huge, huge illegal issues. And thank you to you for raising okay. them outside this as well. I was born in uh, uh, 1961, that was 16 years after um, the end of the Second World War, and where my country, Italy, was uh, really came out prostrated. Uh, not af um, after a civil war and after 25 years of um, dictatorship, fasc fascist dictatorship, where um, the language of Italians, uh, the action, every single um, you know, uh, segment of their life was uh, prescribed. And uh, with, uh, <coughs> also com almost compulsory procreations uh, law to create the Italian soldiers of the future. And uh, then arrived the 70s. So Italy came out of this, uh, sorry, came out of this uh, period um, with, uh, uh, you know, the, the willingness to recreate themselves, the willingness to recreate their relationship. And I remember marching with my mom and dad in the 70s, where workers, female and male workers, together to win the laws um, again uh, for divorce and for abortion. So I'm thinking that, uh, you know, the way what, that we are thinking about society nowadays with this division between me, woman, and you, man, is really not productive at all. I think that if we really want to change society, we have to be together and, uh, and not, uh, um, you know, um, having this... Uh, uh, me and just me and my world uh, type of attitude, and we will gain uh, uh, much, much more. Oh, very good. Okay. Very good. Um, yeah, I think it's really interesting this this whole discussion about consent. No one's. Re yeah. <laughs> should, should know really. Yeah, this whole discussion about consent um, hasn't really been a discussion about rape. No one's really talked about rape and whether consent classes can prevent rape, or uh, it's all been about. Uh, male behaviour. But if you try to actually uh, criticise consent classes, immediately the discussion is all about rape, because you're seen as unsympathetic to rape victims. Um, the idea is that if you can prevent one rape from a consent class, it has to be worth it. So why would you not go to, to a consent class? You must be just completely unsympathetic, unsympathetic to rape victims. Um, so there's that, this question of, well, how do you actually challenge a consent class when there is this sort of, it's like an element of bad faith. It's like, there's this whole agenda saying that, you know, there's a rape culture, we don't like the way that men behave towards women, we don't like men wanting to have sex with women to get a, a notch on the bedpost. Um, but when you actually try to challenge a consent class on that basis... Um, that's a, not, so that's a really good point, actually, because the whole discussion yesterday was about uh, rape and consent classes. Yeah, thank you. The discussion has been really interesting. Um, I've got a daughter, and um, asking your question, uh, to answer your question, Sally, about uh, can relationships be taught... Well, I think they're learned. They learn all the time, from when you're born right through to, mm -hmm. you know, when you're still learning all the way through your life, you're learning about relationships, and you're being taught relationships too. But the question is, should, you know, my wife and I have talked about this, if we have formal uh, relationship classes, I think they're not going to be a nightmare for my daughter, and if possible, we'll both agree to withdraw, to withdraw her from them. Because I think the way it will work is that they will present relationships generally as being difficult, uh, um, complex, uh, dangerous, threatening. And I think the way it will work is the way that some of the panel have talked about it, is that they will blur the lines between uh, banter, your hair looks nice. Are we seriously saying that uh, somebody says your hair looks nice to you, that's a form of some kind of abuse? Is that really what we're saying about how we interact? If those kind of classes teach that and teach that that's basically on a continuum of rape, She's going to grow up with basically a warped view of relationships, and that would be something that I definitely don't want to happen. Okay, thank you. Susan, can I start with you on yes. summing up? Well, s summing up, sorry about repetition, but it's not deviation from the subject. I mean, I, I think uh, consent classes uh, have, have a place, but I don't, want the t I don't like the term, and I think they must be much broader we must be getting uh, and encouraging young people, men, women, cisgender, 
not cisgender, to actually explore the way in which cultural stereotypes actually reinforce particular roles and actually give certain permissions to behave in certain ways. And we must challenge these. I mean, I think that, that the major problem, actually, is the cultural representations that continue out there. And we must get consciousnesses need to be raised, as has already been discussed, so that we can actually be much more political uh, and aware of what's happening around us. Um, and I do think that there should be a much greater program within universities and workplaces that actually address some of these kinds of... It's not just our behaviours. I made that point at the beginning about the problem of privatising, if you like, some of this. It's actually being able to challenge the fact that uh, Jennifer Lawrence in X-Men was presented as uh, being choked. I mean, that is... If, if that's what the way women are presented, we need to be challenging and channeling all of our energies into chan uh, challenging these kinds of representations. Okay, thank you. I think we'll thank our, audience, our panel at the end. Sorry, Alicia? Um, I, just to kind of sum up, I, I think at this moment, um, universities and the higher education sector should have better policies and procedures in place. I don't think that their awareness campaigns are good enough. Um, you'd need to have victims come forward and then be able to have the correct supportive framework in place. Um, I think a bystander approach is the way forward as opposed to consent classes. Um, and I hope, hopefully, in through that, um, you'll have more com communication across gender um, and acknowledging that in order to address, we need to be addressing toxic masculinity as well as addressing the female sexuality, and in and in and away from and moving forward um, to suggest that we all have a role to play in addressing this topic, um, both on university campuses as well as in wider society. Thank you. Oh, um, I, I, I don't want to repeat myself too much, but I do think it's good to talk about uh, what it is about power that is sexy. Why are young women attracted to very powerful men? Why do powerful men feel that they have the right to use women? Um, I think talking is what we need to do. I really commend young people like Alicia who are really moving forward and bringing young people together to talk. I think we should talk not only about toxic masculinity but about toxic femininity. I think we need to look at how we're structuring our sexual identities and our sexual relationships. Okay, I just want to come back very quickly on something that was said um, in the previous round of contributions and has been repeated by Alicia on the panel, this idea that um, we need um, universities or some such organisations to empower female sexuality. I find that quite alarming. I mean, my imagination's going into overdrive as to exactly how this could occur. I mean, I know in some US universities they run workshops for women on how to use sex toys and this kind of thing. But in terms of female sexuality, it really does seem to me, and there's somebody, I'm nicking this from somebody in the audience, I think from Sally's husband, in fact, who said that the best way to do these things is really learning through doing. And if you you want to be empowered in your own sexuality, uh, forget going to classes, um, you know, get out there and have sex because that's the best way to learn about your own sexuality. But I think what's interesting is the premise that underlines that point, this idea that there should be some self-appointed experts. Uh, we are deferring to experts to tell us about our own sexuality. I mean, that's just so sad, if nothing else, never mind the fact that these people are prepared to put themselves up there as experts in sexuality and, and sex and relationships. Um, so we, we've kind of seemed to have reached this consensus that talking is important, so I'm going to be the, the contradictory one who says, you know, I'd qualify that. Yes, talking is important, but not in a consent class, not in a mediated forum where you've got some expert dictating the agenda, telling you, so the topic for today is toxic masculinity, discuss. You know, that's not talking, that's not a spontaneous interaction, that's a scripted performance. And the problem is we're being expected to have these scripted performances um, beyond schools and universities. So, you know, when you tickle your children now as a parent, you tickle your toddler, you're supposed to stop. Immediately the toddler says no, because that teaches them about consent. Whereas a game with my daughter was always to carry on after she said no, and that was the whole fun of it. You know, if you're going to massage a baby, a baby who's not even verbal yet, you're supposed to ask their permission. And what this does is it robs 
the spontaneity, the warmth, the human emotion that comes naturally in relationships is being replaced by this scripted communication that's inserted in our brain from these self-appointed experts, this we, we must, we must do this, we must tell people what to talk about. You know, who is this we? Who is these? Who are these experts? We need to challenge this idea that there are some people among us who have superior insight into relationships because they do not. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the day. <laughs>